la relazione del Cardinal Onayekan sulla eh, situazione eh, che tutti abbiamo, almeno nei suoi termini generali, presente in Nigeria. Il Cardinal eh, Onayekan è arcivescovo di eh, Abuja, Nigeria. È, na ehm, è nato a Cabba in Nigeria, ha ordinato sacerdote nel 1969, ha conseguito una licenza in Sacra Scrittura, un dottorato in Teologia Biblica. È stato ordinato vescovo nel 1983, è stato presidente della Conferenza Episcopale della Nigeria dal 1999 al 2006, è stato proclamato cardina creato cardinale da Benedetto XVI nel Concistoro del 24 novembre 2012. Prego, Eminenza. Grazie tante. Eh, allora, lo racconto in un minuto così. Eh, prima, non, appartengo, non apparteniamo a quei paesi di maggioranza islamica di cui parli, allora forse non dovrei essere qua, eh, eh, perché questo è molto importante anche perché il luogo comune, particolarmente qua in Europa, è che la Nigeria è un paese islamico, non lo siamo, siamo 50-50% e non ci sentiamo islamizzati o oppressi, prima cosa. Il mio, il mio, la mia conferenza parla prima della realtà di violenza in generale nel mio paese, che credo ugualmente a tanti altri paesi. Secondo che c'è l'aspetto di violenza a sfondo religioso, che molto spesso non è, eh, spe, eh, non è particolarmente religioso, ma con aspetto religioso. E finalmente ho detto qualche cosa su ciò che tutti sanno, cioè il terrorismo islamico in Nigeria, sul nome che si chiama Boko Haram, ma vorrei dire che Boko Haram è il nome che altri hanno dato al gruppo. Il gruppo non si chiama Boko Haram. Il gruppo ha un nome arabo che non posso dire adesso, ma che vuol dire l'associazione degli islamici sunniti per il Dawa e per il Jihad. Quello è il loro nome, eh, come lo, secondo loro. Ma i nigeriani li chiamano Boko Haram perché loro parlano, loro eh, si agiscono come que, quelli che rigettano completamente il, eh, il, eh, la cultura occidentale che si chiama Boko. Questa cultura occidentale include sia l'aspetto politico con la struttura democratica democra democratico che abbiamo in Nigeria, lo rigettano completamente, sia l'aspetto religioso, cioè, cioè il cristianesimo. Tutto questo è haram, vuol dire proibito da condannare. E poi ho fatto qualche indicazione sugli eh, ultimi, ultimi sviluppi, spero che cerchiamo di superare questo problema eh, che per noi è veramente molto recente. Thank you. Uh, I think what I have, I can read in 20 minutes and I will read it. First of all, we begin with the general observation that there is violence in the Nigerian culture and I imagine in every other culture. Apart from our history of intertribal wars, past and still present, we also have a history of the colonial conquest, which was also violence although the violence was coming from the Europeans against us, and also the resistance of our Nigerian people against the colonial conquest. Then, even in our independent Nigeria, the most famous experience is the experience of the Nigerian Civil War, otherwise called the Biafra War, in which there is a lot of violence and killing. Following this experience, the country has had to deal very much with criminals, armed robbers, militants of all kinds, kidnappers, most of which are a carryover from the situation of violence in the last decades. There is also the communal violence that has been in the country every now and then between different ethnic groups, between social groups, even between political groups, our elections, have often been marred by serious violence. In this context, therefore, 
the religious dimension simply falls into a relatively normal, and I put normal in inverted commas, normal pattern. People quarrel and fight over many things, and sometimes they fight over religion. Now, terrorism is something new in our country. By terrorism, we mean violent actions that entail indiscriminate killing of innocent people with no clear logical reasons. The terrorism that we are presently witnessing in northern Nigeria, especially the Boko Haram in northeast Nigeria, is therefore an anomaly in our nation. The members of this group are mainly local elements, but they have definitely foreign links and backing. It is suggested that the leaders themselves have been part of terrorist cells and movements outside Nigeria, in the hot spots of world Islamic terrorism like Iraq, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Somalia, and more recently even in Mali. Sometimes the terrorists target specific people, for example, government institutions, and sad to say, churches and Christians. Whether the attack against churches and Christians is specifically religious, and if so, for what purpose, it is still very difficult to understand. We note, however, that they sometimes speak of their desire to impose by force on the whole of Nigeria an Islamic state governed by a strict form of the Sharia, that according to their own reading of it. At other times, they have ordered all non-Muslims to vacate their section of the country, a futile call that fails to recognize the complexity of the Muslim Christian presence on the Nigerian territory. In all this, the terrorism we are noticing has brought in a new level of violence in the damage that they cause to human lives, to properties, and I will say the damage that they cause also to our mutual relationships as Christians and Muslim citizens of one country. To talk of religious terrorism in Nigeria, we must say a little bit on religion in Nigeria. It is often said that Nigeria has three religions. African traditional religion, Islam, and Christianity. But most Nigerians, almost all of us, will say, and we will say more, we will say more than 90% of Nigerians claim to be either Christian or Muslim, and in equal proportion. At the same time, most of us retain our firm root in the African traditional religion. Like, I'm a cardinal of the Catholic Church, but also I'm a Yoruba. And I have not lost the religious, my religious roots as a Yoruba man. If you want details about that, that will be, that will be a matter for another lecture. The distribution of the different faiths. The distribution of the different faiths is anything but even. Although the North is largely Muslim, the South East is largely Christian, and the Southwest and the Middle Belt is very mixed. That's about all that we can say. To speak of a Muslim North and a Christian South is to say the least very inaccurate. The fact is that every part of Nigeria has some elements of both Islam and Christianity in different proportions. Generally, relationship between Nigerians of different faiths is cordial and good and still remains so despite the recent events. It is precisely on the basis of this good relationship that we are building our efforts to overcome our present challenges. The terrorist tensions that we are now experiencing are surely an anomaly that we believe will be overcome sooner than later. Already in recent weeks, there is much talk and debate about dialogue with those who are ready to lay down their arms in view of the possibility of the offer of an amnesty under conditions still to be determined. Of recent, the Federal Government of Nigeria has set up a committee made up of mostly devout Muslims to reach out to the militants with a view to working out any possible modalities for such an amnesty program. The committee is still to come out with any tangible result. Religious violence in Nigeria is very often with mixed motives. 
what appears as religious violence may actually be due to ethnic, political, or socioeconomic reasons. And I'll give you a few examples. For example, when two neighboring or even overlapping ethnic groups are fighting over scarce resources, like who owns the land, if one is largely Christian and the other is largely Muslim, their struggles and their battles become battles between Christians and Muslims, even though religion may have little or no part to play in the origin and the cause of the conflict. In this regard, there are many cases now where communities of farmers who are generally Christians are having to engage groups of nomadic Muslim cattle rearers. The age-old antagonism between farmers and pastors, the story of Cain and Abel, is continuing even today in my country. Because one side is seen as Christian and the other group is perceived as Muslim, the conflict is seen as a religious war. Cases where we have violence for purely religious reasons are indeed very, very rare. What is important now is to make sure that religion, which is a very important aspect of the life of Nigerians, is deployed as effectively as possible for peace all across the board. Now let us talk specifically about the terrorist group in the northeast of Nigeria, generally called Boko Haram and their impact on religion in general, in Nigeria. On the surface, they are perceived as religious. Everybody calls them Islamic terrorists, an appellation which many Nigerian Muslims resent, like we heard also yesterday in some of the presentations, on the ground that their activities are against the tenets of Islam. The fact, however, is that they are clearly Muslims. They are not Legion of Mary boys and call themselves so. Not only that, in their exploits and attacks, especially against Christians, they always shout the Islamic slogan, Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar. Therefore, the Muslim community in Nigeria cannot deny them, as it has tried to do for a long time. Even though it is encouraging to know that they do not represent the authentic face of Islam in our country. And I have said this several times, Boko Haram does not represent the authentic face of Nigerian Islam. That is why we believe that religious leaders have a role to play in containing and eventually solving this problem. The recent call of the Sultan of Sokoto, a good friend of mine, who is the most visible leader of the Nigerian Islamic community, for an amnesty for the terrorists and the support that his proposal is receiving from some of us Christian leaders has generated a debate that I believe will be very fruitful. In this regard, I have already mentioned the step taken by government to set up a committee to study the issue and offer recommendations for useful action. On the whole, it will seem that the action of government lacks coherence. For a long time, government tended to underestimate the seriousness of the phenomenon and approached it in the spirit of maintaining law and order. First the police, then the army were sent to deal with them. Despite vigorous efforts in this line, the terrorists seemed to be waxing stronger and growing in number by the day. It has been alleged that the crude methods used by the security agents have often alienated the communities among whom the terrorists live and operate, thus making their task ever more problematic. How does a soldier deal nicely with armed militants without uniform, melting with the people in the villages, and practically turning the innocent civilian population into a human shield? This has opened our government to some harsh criticism from some human rights organizations which ac accuse our soldiers of crimes against humanity. If, if there are any questions, I can expatiate. This may be why the government decided to try the approach of dialogue and offer of amnesty to militants who are ready to lay down their arms and embrace reconciliation. There is a great problem of who is going to negotiate with whom up to, the, up to now. We don't know who is Boko Haram. 
they have no structures visible. We don't know their leaders. Once in a while, somebody sends a, a text message to newspapers abroad, but they don't know who they are. The only branch of government has also been rejected outright by one or two of people who claim to be speaking on behalf of Boko Haram. It is hoped that at least some others will accept the offer of peace. For a long time, the Nigerian political class tended to seek political capital from the tragedy of a bloody insecurity. Government, on its part, accused the opposition of fomenting the rebellion. The opposition, on their own part, condemned the government as incompetent and unable to rule the nation. In the midst of the finger pointing, Nigerians continued to be killed and economic and social life were grinding to a halt in the more affected areas. It seems, however, that of recent, there are signs of political cooperation at the highest level across political boundaries. A clear demonstration of this is the way the state of emergency was declared in three states. We have 36 states in Nigeria. Three states are the most affected along the northeast borders of Nigeria, which are most affected by the insurgency. And these states are called Borno, Yobe, and Adamawa. They are the borders with Cameroon, Chad, Cameroon and Chad, largely. In all these states, the democratic structures that have been left in place, which have been left in place, which means that the state governments of Borno and Yobe, under an opposition political party, are cooperating with the federal government in addressing the common danger. With the state of emergency, the government has launched a vigorous and robust military action, which is already succeeding in dislodging and scattering the militants from their camps and installations. Very little news is coming from the battlegrounds. The military action involves both Nigerian and non-Nigerian troops from our neighboring countries. It is also rumored, but no, not clearly declared, that our country has accepted specialized assistance of expertise and equipment from faraway nations like Britain, USA, and Israel. We are waiting and hoping for the best. As the military action is going on, we need to think of what comes next after the phase of military engagement. We are still waiting to see what plans we have for genuine reconciliation, rehabilitation, and reorientation of the many who have been convinced to turn against their nation. I believe this is where religious communities will have an important role to play. These few years of sectarian violence has done a lot of harm on our hard-earned and fragile climate of good relations between Muslims and Christians in Nigeria. Both communities will need to work hard to restore and promote mutual understanding and respect. And this calls for hard work and patience, especially on the part of the religious leaders in both camps. Finally, having said all the above, we must stress that the Boko Haram is a complex phenomenon. There are social, political, and ethnic dimensions. All these factors must be addressed along with the religious dimension, apart from also from the military. Religion, therefore, becomes one among the many approaches to the solution. This religious approach should start with the House of Islam, doing all it can to put its own house in order. I have said this several times in my country. At first, my Muslim friends resented me saying so, but I think they have agreed that yes, they have a problem and that they have a job to do. We Christians, on our part, need to have positive attitude to Islam in general, so that along with our brother Muslims, we can jointly face the challenge of Islamic terrorism. It's not easy for a Catholic cardinal to tell Christians whose churches have just been bombed and people killed that, listen, don't blame Muslims for this. They ask me, whom do we blame? But if we do not help our people to distinguish between the activities of terrorists and the Muslim community with whom we live, then we, begin, we, we are preparing the ground for a major sectarian division in our country 
which will do nobody no good and which I believe Jesus does not want me to promote. It means seeking common grounds, stressing the things that bind us together, and emphasizing what we hold as shared religious values. Furthermore, we can jointly work to address the challenges that face us all in terms of poverty, bad governance, sickness, the, and so on. When we look at all this and we act together, we shall be able to build a community that can work and walk together as one body, one community, one nation, despite our different religions. In all this, there is need for coordination of all our efforts. I believe this is where the responsibility of government largely lies. A responsibility which, unfortunately, we have so far not been seeing much evidence of.